In the late 1700s, the world was on the cusp of a new age, an industrial revolution. The water wheels and windmills wouldn't be enough to propel the biggest economies on the planet into this new age. They needed to find an artificial power to grow the production of their mines, factories, and mills. The solution would come in the form of James Watt, a man who felt destined to become a navigation tool craftsmith, but upon discovering the inefficiencies with the very first steam engines, knew that he could make it better, becoming one of the most impactful engineers that helped thrust England's technological and economic progress into the future, bringing the rest of humanity along with it. This is the story of James Watt, inventor of the steam engine, and this is Learn Something New. James Watt was born on January 19, 1736, in the quiet fishing village of Greenock, Scotland, to parents James Watt and Agnes Muirhead. James Jr. came from a line of intelligent and successful men and women, with his mother coming from a well-educated high-class family and his father being one of the most prolific carpenters and shipwrights in Greenock. Like his parents, the young James Watt showed promise from a very young age, especially in math, but he would be unable to attend school regularly because he would have persistent bouts of severe migraines, which often left him bedridden. Those who would meet him at an early age would see a thin, weak child. But just because he wasn't in the classroom didn't mean he wasn't learning. From an extremely young age, Watt became an avid reader, always seeking out the next book he could learn something from. By age six, he was able to solve geometrical problems, and by his early teens, he began to make models of old and current technologies, spending his free time with his father, helping to repair many navigation tools of the era. His engineering skills, along with his understanding of mathematics, would only grow as his father gave him access to his tools and forge in his workshop. But as Watt came close to entering adulthood, his mother passed away, and his father, whose health was also beginning to fail, made a series of bad business decisions that squandered the family's money and opportunities within Greenock. And so, Watt decided to set off for London, hoping to become a mathematical instrument maker, and a family member would help arrange an apprenticeship for when he arrived. Once there, John Morgan took Watt in as his apprentice and was willing to teach him the ins and outs of the trade. And even though he had little money to pay James with, James would work far longer hours than any of his peers, toiling away within the workshop. This, combined with his previous experience from his father's workshop, allowed him to progress far quicker than any of the other apprentices working under Morgan, but it didn't come without a price. The long hours and hard work began to take a toll on Watt, and despite the apprenticeship typically lasting seven years, he had to drop out after just one. Moving to Glasgow, Scotland, James applied for a permit from the Glasgow Guild of Hammermen to open up a shop there. But despite there being exceptionally few mathematical instrument makers in Scotland at the time, he was denied, having not completed a full seven years in his apprenticeship. In a quick pivot, Watt instead managed to get a job at the University of Glasgow, proving to professors that despite his short formal training, he was more than qualified to repair the instruments, many of which were then installed in the campus's McFarlane Observatory. He was allowed to set up a small workshop at the university in 1757, where he could sell quadrants, compasses, and scales that he himself built. Although during his time there, he would meet several famous individuals, including physicist Joseph Black and philosopher Adam Smith, one of the more impactful relationships he would form was with John Craig, a local businessman who partnered with Watt in opening a music store in Glasgow. Over the next six years, the two would go on to employ 16 workers as the store thrived, only being taken over by one of the employees when John Craig died. James Watt couldn't run the store himself because he was hard at work coming up with one of the most impactful inventions in history. Now, to clarify, James Watt wasn't the first person to come up with the idea for a steam engine, far from it. The design that would inspire Watt was an engine design that dated all the way back to 1698, patented by Thomas Savory. It was a pump that used steam under pressure to force water from the depths of the British coal mines to the surface. The device was very rudimentary, being the first of its kind, and was quickly superseded by Thomas Newcomen's design, though this too had its issues, being extremely fuel inefficient. This wasn't seen as too big of an issue at the time, because the mines the engines were used in were literally extracting the fuel used in the engines. 
but it did limit the engines used to these mines, these coal mines, as opposed to something like a factory or even a copper or tin mine. And it was in 1764 that James Watt realized for himself just how inefficient the design of the Newcomen engine was, as he repaired one that had been brought into his workshop. Instead of just repairing it and sending it back, he decided to improve it. One year later, he had come up with a solution, giving the engine a separate condenser to help combat the loss of latent heat. You see, he had found that, while it originally would cool down every time cold water was injected into the cylinder to replace the water that had already evaporated off, instead he could have a separate condenser that would intake the new water and enact a condensation effect before sending it into the main cylinder. From here, Watt was hooked, convinced that there was a lot more progress to be made, even on his improved version. And it was around this time that he met another inventor, John Roebuck, who encouraged James Watt to follow his gut and pursue making his own engine. They would later enter into a partnership as Watt finished a scaled down prototype. He was convinced a more efficient engine could expand its use cases exponentially, but it wasn't easy to make an engine from scratch. His progress would regularly stall whenever he needed specific parts machined to a certain specification that simply didn't exist at the time. With progress slowing, Watt was running out of money, and so, from 1766 to 1774, he would work as a land surveyor, helping to mark out routes for canals across Scotland, severely limiting the time he could work on the new engine. His partner, John Roebuck, was little to help financially, going bankrupt in 1772. But when Watt met an engineer named Matthew Boulton, he figured that he might have a shot at making it work. Watt moved again to Birmingham, England with Boulton where he would gain access to some of the best iron workers in the world, able to produce the precise parts he needed to make the engine work. Boulton, believing that they were close to a final product, threw as much money as Watt needed at the project. And he was right, as in 1776, they had produced two engines fully functional and ready to be installed. One was installed to pump water like many other engines before, but the other was used to blow air into forges, foreshadowing the engine's rapid expansion and uses to come. Instantly, the new, more efficient engines were a hit, being sought after at first by every major mine in the area, especially the tin and copper mines looking to reduce fuel costs. In return, Boulton and Watt would charge one-third of the value of coal saved when compared to the Newcomen engine performing the same work an arrangement that greatly benefited both parties. While by 1780, James was doing well financially and content to serve the mining industry, Bolton wanted to take it a step further, entering into the milling industries. This would prove to be a great move, especially when paired with Watt's improvement of the engine, adding a gear that allowed for two revolutions for each cycle of the engine, making it even more efficient. They were both on a roll, with Bolton handling the business side of things and Watt constantly coming up with new ways to revolutionize the engineering of the machine. By 1790, Watt had effectively completed what's known today as the Watt engine, with the addition of a pressure gauge. Orders were flooding in from all over, from paper mills to iron mills, mines to distilleries, and more. Watt was now very wealthy, and he began to leave the design of his engine alone, finally satisfied with it. He traveled more, he bought an estate for his family, and as he got older, he removed himself more and more from the business. By the year 1800, the same year Watt officially retired, Britain had over 2,500 steam engines operating within the country, while France and the US were closer to 200. The engine, of course, would continue being improved upon, but as for Watt, he spent the remaining 19 years of his life traveling around Europe visiting friends and family, and while he was home, he would tinker away in his workshop, going on to pass away at the age of 83 on August 25th, 1819. Thanks for watching Learn Something New. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing to the channel, or if you want, you can check out the channel's Patreon, linked below in the description. Special thanks to the channel's patrons, but as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.